What do you call a person who believes in Jesus Christ as their Lord and as their Savior? Uh, some of the first names that come to mind might be Christian, very common today. If you look at the book of Acts, the word brother and uh, sister is used quite often, or children of God. We've seen a lot as we've studied the book of 1 John. Uh, but also today as we get into 2 John, we're going to look at the fact that many times throughout the Bible and throughout the New Testament and Old Testament, uh, believers are referred to as the elect of God. So as we're in 2 John verse 1, we find out that John the elder, the apostle, has written the letter and he's written it to the elect. Now, many times this word is used to acknowledge who the people are and whose the people are. And it's meant as a confirmation of their belief. It's meant to add extra assurance of their salvation, that God has chosen them unto salvation. And the term brings great comfort. Uh, however, today, if you were to walk into a group of those who profess to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, or perhaps your local church, if you were to walk in on Sunday and just shout out to everyone, greetings, uh, the elect of God, or hello, elect of God, or something to that effect, uh, what, what would they do? Well, most of them might be a little put off by that term and not know what you're talking about. And then while others might just be clearly upset and think you're trying to start a fight. But as we look to the Bible, God's revelation of himself, this the Bible that is inspired by God, uh, breathed out by God, we find the term used a lot. And the term is actually used by the apostles as they write and as they describe believers. So let's just look at a few examples of that. The first one we've quickly covered there in 2 John verse 1. Uh, but let's move on to, say, uh, 1 Peter 1 verse 1. Peter writes, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. So again, he opens his letter up. Who is Peter writing to? He's writing to the elect. Uh, Titus 1.1, Paul writes this. He says, uh, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the sake of the faith of God's elect. So once again, we find that Paul is writing to the elect. Who are the elect? They're God's elect. We're speaking of elect unto salvation. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1, Paul similarly writes, we'll start at verse 3 and uh, verse 4. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. And you'll notice oftentimes in the, in the word of God, the word uh, election, the word chosen, the word predestination comes up quite often. And who is doing this work? It's always God who is doing the election, who is doing the choosing, who is doing the predestination. As we see here, it is before the foundation of the world. What were you doing before the foundation of the world? What was I doing before the world was created? Uh, nothing, but God was doing everything. And so God has done this. Uh, moving on quickly, 2 Thessalonians 2.13. Uh, close to the front of uh, 2 Thessalonians, not quite a greeting, but he does say, but we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved. Now, the point of this is, is that Paul, nor Peter, nor John is throwing this term out there to be controversial. But today, uh, in today's modern Christianity, that word is highly controversial, but it should not be. In fact, this term is used to actually give comfort to those that he is writing to. And uh, now, now many times people will say, I'm just going to cover this quickly, just have a couple of minutes, uh, well, well, God did not do this without looking into the future. Perhaps he looked into the future and saw those who were going to choose him, so therefore he chose them. Uh, and that's really putting everything opposite of what we see in the Word of God. God is not looking into the future to see who would choose him. The Word of God is clear that we are spiritually dead. No one is going to choose the most righteous, holy uh, per, uh, God person and, and, and believe in him for salvation, confess their sin without Jesus, without God previously 
uh, giving them a new heart. How do we get a new heart? Well, we must be regenerated. How can we get regenerated? Well, God does that, and that is the, the work of the Holy Spirit. So those who are elect do believe in God. They do repent of their sins, and they do that because they are elect. So the regeneration, what God begins in our salvation, uh, culminates with faith to believe in him with repentance of our sin, sanctification, justification, redemption, and finally glorification. But all of this from step one to the last step, step 100 if you'd say, is all the work of God. So who gets the glory for your salvation? It is God. God gets all the glory for our salvation. Uh, Ephesians 1 5 says this, in love he, God, predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. So this is extremely important as we think upon our salvation. Uh, you might be sitting there thinking, well, I, I remember hearing the gospel and I remember believing in the gospel and repenting of my sins. And there was an awareness of my sin and a desire to love God and pursue right living. And that's great. That is wonderful. And regenera regeneration precedes faith, it precedes repentance, but oftentimes it happens in such a similar moment that we can think that we have done something. But we must remember that we're spiritually dead. None of us are righteous. No one can take a step towards God, but God moves towards us. He brings us a new heart with new desires, and from that we move forward in belief and in repentance. Ephesians 1.5, this is done according to the purpose of His will. Now, as you look at this, like Ephesians 1.5, uh, what, what are the people supposed to do when they hear of this? And, and from John, from Paul, from Peter, or here in Ephesians uh, 1, 5, and 6 by Paul. Uh, chapter 1, verse 6 says this, To the praise of His glorious grace with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. So, long story short, the human tendency is to take credit for everything. Not just the small things, but the biggest things. Even our salvation. But instead, we shouldn't do that. All of our, our, our salvation from beginning to end is the work of God. And we read verses like this and it is extremely humbling to know that God did this. And when you begin to think, what did I do to earn my salvation? What did I do to achieve this when others did not? You're thinking in the wrong category. Instead, you have to understand as the Word of God lays out, it is purely of grace that is unmerited favor of God that you have been rescued, that you have been saved, that you saw your sin, you saw the light of Jesus Christ, and you believe in Him, and you repent of your sins. So, long story short, as this word comes up, as it does, as you read the Word of God, we're covering 2 John, again, verse 1, and there it is. A lot of pastors ignore the Word and move on quickly to the next word and camp out on it. A lot of people, when they read the Word of God, skip over that word and what that word means, but you shouldn't. That word is just as inspired as the other words that are there. So read it. Take comfort in such a thing and give God all the glory for your salvation. Sola Deo Gloria. Thanks for listening. Have a great day.